Hi, I'm Todd Oldham and welcome to my retrospective here at the RISD Museum in Providence, Rhode Island. This is a, a beautiful time to enter this world of fashion design. You can find so many opportunities to express yourself and do things in a, a proper humane way. Chinchilla is quite uh, desirable in the fur industry. It feels exquisitely soft and the animals are quite small and whenever you see a chinchilla coat you're watching a bloodbath. There can be anywhere from 80 to 200 chinchillas involved in a coat. So we thought uh, we would be happy to pay an homage to them that didn't harm them. The faux chinchilla collar was made for us by this German company called Tiber, just did exquisite furs. And this is a polyester satin that we airbrushed. We created a band uh, using cardboard and straight pins uh, set at different lengths that would sort of mirror the edge of the stripes on the chinchilla. And so we would airbrush it until the ink sort of welled up on the needles and then do quick pulls to sort of give you that streaky striation. They tend to recede or recompress, so you see the upper part of the body has a thinner stripe, and then as the dress gets longer, the stripes sort of widen. Silkskin is some of the most beautiful fur and some of the most desirable, and certainly some of the most hideously cruel. We found a really nice synthetic for us. We had this woven in Italy, and I've never really seen sealskin re-embroidered, but we added uh, beautiful antique seed beads and several different uh, diameters of sequins to create this wavy pattern, sort of an homage to the water splash that the seals participate in. This is a technique called la montage, developed by an incredible artist named Leora Manet. It's a felting process where polyester fibers are pulled and layered in specific ways, and then entangled with needles that have notches on it. This piece was laid just like tile. Those tile pieces were cut separately and laid on, so as you see in the folds of the sleeve, they actually hinge like their tile. They fold in the break lines, the grout lines of the tile. It feels exactly like cashmere. When we created these embroideries, we had to find a base cloth this actual 24 karat gold bullion could be applied to, so we used a synthetic polyester crepe, so it's still draped into the body. The bodice of the blouse was also embroidered on polyester crepe, and the sleeves are a rayon matte jersey. So we were able to capture all the luxness of the most expensive couture, but without harming anything along the way. So this comforter here was sort of made as an homage to ski coats. Uh, I say comforter, it's actually a stole, but it looks as large as a comforter. And uh, ski clothes were primarily lined and down, but we found a very nice fluffy synthetic that mirrored that without involving the cruelty or the unfortunate plucking of feathers while birds are alive. Uh, this ensemble is a great example of how to use alternative ground fabrics, but still achieve the materiality of what we know is like silk satin on this skirt, this beautiful shiny synthetic. And then the fur was made by a German company that was at the time was one of the most advanced fake furriers. And we would patch together different kinds of furs and have them change the colors. The 70s ruined synthetics for a long, long time. It was the Japanese designers like Rei Kawakabu at Komde Garçan that started doing things with synthetic fibers and started making them look fresh and original and just as lush as the other materials. So slowly the industry started embracing it. The fabrics I had the opportunity to work with are so different than what's available today. Synthetic is our, or polyester is no longer a cuss word in the fashion industry. All the cutting edge designers now are full of raw edge, synthetic, sharp moving things. It's great to see that embraced. And I'm sure if we look at the numbers, there must be some decline in the animal uses. But we found our pathways through the odd routes. For instance, like working with ski manufacturers in Germany and Italy to do incredible synthetics that we could then do dye sublimation printing on top. We started doing beading on linen, you know, something that really wasn't done. Linen's a very strong fiber. The reason you beat on silk is because it's, the tensile strength is very strong, but bugs are involved, so linen, one of our strongest, most wicking fibers, right? There's always a solution, and it's just about being creative, inventive, doing your research, and in today's market, this should not be hard. One of the most exciting Exciting new adventures in textiles is the recycled materials. Uh, right at the end of when I stopped designing in the late 90s, there were things that were being made out of recycled plastic bottles, and the fabrics were just extraordinary. They felt like the most kind of cybery fleeces and things. So it was really nice to see just at the tip of that the recycling coming. And now, all over the place, we have beautiful fabrics made out of bamboo, all kinds of pulps. One thing that always was very dear to me was the need to protect animals as opposed to use them in fashion. Animal fur is very beautiful and most beautiful when left on the animal. You can celebrate animals, I mean, what's more beautiful than nature, but you don't need to harm it. I have a curious mind, so I always want to know where and why and how and 
I try to be as conscionable in my behavior and in my business practices as I can. So of course you want to find out what runoffs are involved in fabrics or waste issues or in the case of fabrics or fibers that are, come from animals, you really want to find out what's going on. Once one finds out what is actually involved in the leather industries or the fur industries or in the wool industries, it's impossible to think that you would really choose that. As a new designer, the fur industries and the leather industries will sponsor or give you money to use their products. In the case of using extravagant furs, that can give a designer an alleged leg up in the industry. You look extravagant, you can pull off these things that are attractive to the industry. However, there's still that same cruelty batch behind it, but it's so seductive, it comes with money and they get to use it, it's almost impossible to deny when you're first starting. But the repair for that is consciousness. Know what you're getting into. The opportunities for a fashion student to choose wisely are to be taken very seriously. The most important thing is to do your research, know what you're doing, know what's behind this beautiful thing, and make sure that that feels like it's from your heart. I would imagine once the cruelty is exposed, you don't want to embrace it. I'm endlessly amazed that people remember what we did and I mean, I'm standing in a museum. <laughs> I got to be a part uh, of a very interesting forefront in animal rights in the 90s. I mean, fashion was not talked about. There was only a handful of us, me and Stella and Mark Bauer. So instead of trying to redo what I think our cultural definement of beauty and extravagance is, I thought, why don't we find new ways to make that as desirable but not have a trail of cruelty behind it. I don't think we need any more examples of cruelty or lack of kindness or compassion or understanding for one another. To make these little efforts in our life really do have a huge hold, and it's worth it. Thank you so much for joining on a tour today of The Retrospective. It was very fun sharing it with you and sort of re-exploring these passions of mine. I hope that whatever your passions are will come to fruition. Lots of research will lead great results and a lack of cruelty will always make beauty transcendent. Thank you.